Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by John Hodge. Today, we're discussing the Edmonton Elks making a change to their coaching staff. Bo Levi Mitchell suffering a broken leg. Craig Dickinson sticking with Mason Fine as the team's starting quarterback for now. A 1966 Grey Cup ring currently up for sale. And our picks for week nine in the CFL. But first... Hodge, we were in Halifax this past week for Touchdown Atlantic. We're going to have an intriguing discussion about our experiences, what we saw, what we did, and what we learned, most importantly. But first, I want to ask the question everybody has want answered for over 40 years. Is the CFL going to expand to the Maritimes? Yes or no? And I'm going to hold you to it. Yes, I think it is. Whoa! It is Yes, I do. I will say... I've always been bullish on expansion to the Maritimes, but I also want to provide context for that. I mean, I'm a lifelong Manitoban. I've traveled a a decent amount around this country, but I'm certainly not as well-traveled even as many of our listeners are. I've always wanted to go out east. This was my first opportunity to, to go east of Montreal, and something that I was so taken aback by in Halifax was just how amazing and beautiful the city is. Every neighborhood that we walked through, Dunk, we walked extensively through Halifax, traveled extensively through Halifax, spent a lot of time, yes, in the touristy sections of the city, but, you know, walked through, you know, most most of the neighborhoods. And we stayed not in the downtown core. We were about 10 minutes north of the downtown core in Halifax, about an hour's walk of the common. I was just so taken aback by how beautiful the city is and how much economic development there is in the city. I mean, you walk through Halifax and it's like, wow, this must be the this must be the really nice neighborhood. I wonder what the next one is. And you get to the next neighborhood and you kind of go like, oh, this is nice, too. Uh, (laughs) Like my wife is from Toronto. We spend a couple weeks a year there. And I have since we started dating 11, 12 years ago. And Halifax to me felt like Toronto, but on a bit of a smaller scale. And then way cleaner, way nicer. And it's shocking to me that a city of that caliber with that many sports fans, we'll talk about the local teams there and the support they get in the stadiums that they have in a moment. But the opportunity in Halifax, I think, is simply too good. Obviously, the city has close to half a million people. Yes, that would make it the second smallest city in the CFL. But it's over twice the size of Regina. And while Regina can draw on the rest of the population of Saskatchewan, which is over a million people, In the Maritimes, you've got almost 2 million people within a two-hour drive of Halifax. To me, a team out there obviously need proper ownership. A team could absolutely work. And I think that it would be, depending on where the stadium is, one of the, if not the best game day experience in the CFL. I'm that bullish on it. I'm with you here, Hodge. I know a lot of people have been responding to our articles and tweets and threads and probably on Instagram as well about us posting about Randy Ambrosi's comments and us even being positive about a potential expansion franchise in the Maritimes and saying, well, the CFL has been talking about this for so long, they should have already done it. But this feels different to me. And I've been through these conversations a number of years now, covering the league from an in-depth perspective, going all the way back, what's got to be like 2011 now. So not as long as some other people in the media, but this feels different. This feels more real. There's a lot of positivity in Halifax about this. And I think some of the keys here, and we'll get to as many of them as we can throughout this discussion, but the real keys here for me are a couple of stadium concepts, the Halifax Wanderers grounds and St. Mary's University Husky Stadium, where the game was played last Saturday. And I think Husky Stadium is more readily doable for a CFL expansion franchise to go there. And most importantly, St. Mary's University owns that land. So the city technically wouldn't even have to sign off on a stadium concept potentially going in there. And St. Mary's University wants this. And rightfully so. If St. Mary's University gets a stadium of this caliber on their campus Yes, it's great for the CFL and for the football games that they could host there, but for the other events that they could have there on campus, it would boost not only St. Mary's in terms of the amount of students that would enroll there, but I think just the economics for that university as a whole. You could have concerts there the entire summer and potentially 
even events such as, and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much, but an outdoor hockey NHL game. Could you imagine Sidney Crosby, who was from out there, or Nathan <laughs> McKinnon going to that stadium, playing in an outdoor game, and how much interest there would be? Now, obviously, we need a stadium of that size first for these types of things to happen, but this is what St. Mary's, I think, smartly is envisioning in terms of welcoming a CFL stadium there. And we can see the footprint. I've been there a number of times to St. Mary's and Steve Samara, the head coach of the Huskies football team was kind enough to show us around the facilities there and the boost that it would give to that football program, the athletic department on top of just the sheer economics would be great for SMU. So there are many reasons to be positive about the potential of it. But Hodge, I will say that until I see it with my own eyes, I won't believe it like a lot of our viewers and listeners and readers out there on 3downnation.com. Well, I don't blame anybody for being skeptical about this. I totally 100% get that. Perfectly valid. This has been something that's been talked about, Dunk, since before you or I were alive. Like back (laughs) in, I think it was 1981, 1982, there was a conditional franchise granted. And 20 years ago, Mark Cohan hosted the first TD Atlantic in Halifax at that same stadium, Husky Stadium at St. Mary's University. So in many ways, each generation, right, every 20 years, somebody comes up with this amazing idea and pretends that they've reinvented the wheel and it's new and it's fresh, when in fact it is just regurgitating old ideas and hoping that they stick this time. I'm not positive that this idea will stick this time. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but Randy Ambrosi did indicate that there are multiple franchise owners potential franchise owners interested and we also heard that from non-cfl sources who had boots on the ground in halifax which i took to be very interesting the other thing that i will speculate is given how bullish a lot of the folks around expansion are my speculation would be that the only reason that a conditional franchise has not already been awarded is that you have multiple ownership groups who are interested and the league is doing its best to have them bid against each other because obviously not only does the CFL want the best possible ownership group, they also want right the best financial kickback for the rest of its teams in the form presumably of an expansion fee. We, we haven't had an expansion fee in the CFL recently enough that I think we could potentially ballpark one appropriately. But at the end of the day, the CFL, I think, realizes if they're going to do this, they have to do it right. And they need to find the perfect owner or at least at least a very, very good owner. They've they've hit home runs, I think, in B.C. and Montreal. They're looking to hit another one out east. Let's talk about the stadiums because we already talked about Husky Stadium a little bit, Dunk. I'll talk about the Wanderers grounds, right? We, We know that the CFL is not going to get a stadium built for it, essentially, Uh, from the city's behalf that is not going to take place the cfl is not going to get a cfl only stadium they're going to have to share the wanderers grounds is the best location for a stadium in halifax and i think would give halifax the arguably best location of any stadium in the cfl that's that location where the halifax wanderers of the canadian premier league plays is incredible you've got a ton of green space you're about a half a kilometer south of the common which is the largest urban park in the maritime, super lively, super entertaining in the summertime. You got all these live sports happening and events. It's lined with local businesses and beer gardens, a very cool place to hang out. And you're only about one kilometer west of the downtown waterfront, which as we saw, especially on the weekends, is unbelievably busy. We we tried to get to a restaurant that had a two and a half hour wait. Like (laughs) people are humming there. There's so much to do. Along the boardwalk, it's a super fun time and I think would provide people. There's not a lot of parking, but I don't think that matters when people are walking from local businesses or presumably, you know, parking elsewhere and then walking to the game after having a nice dinner or after having a drink at a local bar. And then, of course, they can go back to those bars when the game is done. The party atmosphere, even the night before the game, Friday, as we were watching the Ticats Red Blacks game with a bunch of Argos fans was amazing at a local establishment. So the Wanderers grounds location is incredible. The downside is the infrastructure is almost non-existent. The Wanderers host between six and 6,000, 6,500 fans approximately for their games. The capacity online is listed as such. However, there was a sign there that indicated that capacity was closer to 8,000. There is one grandstand that's quite large, but it is temporary. 
the rest of the seating is pretty rinky dink and the locker rooms are, I think, uh, I don't know a polite way to say it. They're built out of temporary shipping containers or repurposed shipping containers. There's also no running water on the facility and there's also no food service. Now the Wanderers are supposedly getting a more permanent stadium built. What does that mean? I don't know. It has not formally been announced yet. It's not been officially con confirmed. The reporting around it is that it, it's happening and, or at least the, the, the current owner is confident that it's going to happen. So the Wanderers grounds to me location is the better location, but there is so much to do there. There also, I don't think with the existing footprint of the soccer stadium, I don't think you could put a CFL stadium. There's a couple of small businesses around it that are city owned that you would have to, to demolish. And I don't think the city wants to do that, at least coming out of COVID and now these horrific storms that have unfortunately flooded a lot of the province of Nova Scotia and, and unfortunately taken some, some, some people's lives there. And by the way, we want to extend our condolences to those who are affected by the flooding in and around Halifax, obviously a horrible situation there. And kudos to the, the host city and the CFL for having TD Atlantic go off without a hitch coming out of that tragedy. But the, the St. Mary's uh, facility, Husky Stadium, has a lot of permanent infrastructure. We learned that apparently there is a 20-year plan, 20-year-old plan to build it out to be a 24,000-seat stadium. And it wouldn't affect really any of the existing infrastructure there. There's enough space to do it. The only concern I had was the track going around the field. And you saw it on the broadcast, the kind of bright, kind of sky blue, I don't know what you call the color, track that goes around the field. And having been there and talked to some people, it's clear the university would shed no tears if it disappeared. It's not regulation. There's only seven lanes on the straights and six on the curves. And the surface is also not good. It's it, You can see it when you walk on it. There's a lot of tears. It's it's kind of in disrepair. So to me, the if, if you were willing to invest the money as a province, as a city, as a team, whatever, the Wanderers Grounds provides an amazing opportunity. But St. Mary's would still be a very good spot for a CFL team. It's about two kilometers west of the waterfront. It's about one kilometer south of the common. And that was that was what we saw from our tours there. We talked to locals on the ground. We toured both facilities a ton of potential with both, more so at the Wanderers grounds, but I don't think Husky Stadium is uh, any consolation prize. I think it would still be a very cool environment for a game. For my money, I think Husky Stadium is the better location and the one that could get up to speed much quicker for a lot of the reasons that you laid out, Hodge, and it's not that far from the waterfront. And to take it one step further, we were in and around the tailgate area that was set up for Touchdown Atlantic, and that thing was Pack. So there's enough room at St. Mary's University for them to host CFL games and have that type of space for people to come down, be close to the stadium and enjoy themselves before the actual game kicks off. And some people might talk about how SMU is, you know, really the campus, only the size of a city block, but there's a lot of space there. And I think there's enough space to fit the stadium in there with only doing minimal construction. You don't have to tear any buildings down like you would have to at the Wanderers grounds. And I think there would be some motivation from St. Mary's side to put some money into this project, which it's pretty clear the CFL is not necessarily going to get that money from the city of Halifax to go into a stadium. Yes, in 2019, there was that conditional 20 million that they got from HRM but that went by the wayside after COVID happened and now there's been the forest fires and the flood. So I think there would be more motivation from St. Mary's to put some of their money into it. And if you find an owner who's willing to back this thing, most importantly, the concept, you can see it right in front of your eyes and you went over smartly, the population, the downtown, how it could create a buzz there. Like we asked multiple people who were living in Halifax what they thought of a potential CFL team coming there. And they talked about how there's you know, all these events that go on in Halifax in the summer. And with all due respect, then you say, well, can you name all of these? They talk about the Jazz Fest and Pride Weekend. And I'm sure there are other things that go on there that we don't necessarily know about. There's probably some concerts and stuff like that. But it wasn't like there was like this long list that the CFL couldn't fit into. I think the CFL could absolutely dominate in that market and raise the tide and sort of lift the boats there. I'll steal a line from you, Hodge. And 
you can see just the development of the city, like where we walked and it was a pretty decent amount of walking that we did. I'll give you credit Hodge, but there were condo <laughs> buildings going up in different parts of the city. So credit to you for doing those side hill walking up and down all over the commons. We were on top of the Citadel and, you know, and all just over to, the city. Just to say, we it wasn't the walking that got me it was the plus 40 with the humidex that got me that was <laughs> sure. the problem if it's 18 degrees your boy can walk all day every day <laughs> in that type of heat your boy can't do much but lay on the couch and eat ice cream it is just too hot it is too hot especially with your new new balance kicks with those gel insoles man you did pretty the good the dad shoes let's go <laughs> but Back to the point I was making is, Hodge, you would agree with this. Everywhere we went, we thought, well, you know, so people in Halifax were telling us the CFL is too corporate, but you see all these fancy new condo buildings being put up and cranes that are set up to get them up there. And we're thinking, no, this place is so ideal for the CFL that they could do so well there. And I mean, there's all the things from a league perspective that would be so great, a balanced schedule, the 10th team truly being coast to coast and the rest, less bye weeks as well. But just from that perspective, you know, being there for a second year in a row and actually seeing a game at Husky Stadium, because in 2022, the game was out at Acadia University and they did a great job there. The Axemen and their people, I think, did a wonderful job of setting it up for the CFL. They're actually interested in potentially getting a touchdown Atlantic game back out on campus there again next year. We'll see if that actually happens. The one thing I will say is I like how this CFL is going about this, this time they're being very tight lipped. And I think they want to get all of their boats in a row before they say anything publicly. And I think that's why Hodge, you and I feel so positive based on the people that we've talked to, because I think there is a lot of positivity going around about this, but I think the CFL wants to actually have a stadium concept agreed upon with St. Mary's university. If indeed that's where the stadium ends up and have an owner who's willing to back it and perhaps not go through the city or just the city has to kind of go along with everything and not put a ton of money into it. So from that perspective, I think it's smart because as you said, going all the way back to 1982, it's great to have a conditional franchise awarded, but if all your boats aren't lined up, then the idea is going to sink. And that's something that you talked about the the size of the campus at St. Mary's. That's something I don't see as a negative. I think you want an intimate atmosphere that is packed and feels loud and feels proud. The attendance for this game was 11,555. It was a sellout. And a CFL team, I don't think, could live on that. But if you could get to, let's say, 16,000, even at the start with expansion to 20,000, maybe down the line, I think that is a very nice starting place, especially if you can maximize the tailgate opportunities like we saw at TD Atlantic. The tailgate was packed. It was super fun. All nine teams were represented. From what I could see, there was even a family from Germany who we spoke to walking around in Frankfurt Galaxy gear, which I thought was amazing. It might actually be the most impressive thing to come out of the CFL Global Initiative. Uh, having these three people at <laughs> at the tailgate, you know, JC will love that too. Yeah, and he's not here to defend the program either. I feel I feel kind of bad, <laughs> but uh, the point is, it was a great event. I thought it was fantastic, and it's something that should be done ten times a year in Halifax. I will say, since you touched on it, there is buzz that Acadia University is trying to get this game next year, but there is also some rumors, and were some rumors floating around in Halifax that the CFL next season will be doing a touchdown Atlantic type game, i.e. a neutral site game, but take it elsewhere in Canada, potentially even out West somewhere, which I thought was interesting. I'm also curious to know what they would call a neutral site game out West. Cause obviously TD Atlantic is not an appropriate name. Is it TD Pacific? I guess it depends how close you get to the West coast, but uh, all in all dunk, it was a great uh, trip for us, I thought that, again, the, the CFL was 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 showcased very well. Again, it would have been nice if the game hadn't taken place in, in extremely hot weather. It would have been nice if the game hadn't taken place after, uh, you know, such a such a difficult tragedy for the province and the city to overcome. But all those things considered, it was a great weekend. 
I can't speak highly enough about how well the the game was run, how well the event was run. And again, the positive momentum that really seems to be behind this. But at the end of the day, I do want to qualify that by saying the proof will be in the pudding when it comes to this, because as Randy Ambrosi has said, he wouldn't call this a do or die moment for the CFL, but he has essentially acknowledged that if they can't get this done, it's time to move on, at least for a significant period of time and maybe try to crack the Maritimes nut, so to speak, in, you know, he didn't give a timeline, but I'd speculate that by taking a break and coming back to it, he's talking about a period of, you know, five to 10 years or, or, or potentially even more than a decade. You can't go away from this in 2023 and have it sound like a fresh new cool idea in 2025. You'd have to take a significant break from this thing. Obviously, we hope it doesn't come to that because, again, getting the 10 teams, getting a team out there, I think would be amazing. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. Shout out to Olivier Poulet and his communication staff for taking care of us all week, Hodge. I don't think those guys and people in his team get enough credit for what they do behind the scenes. And also the CFL events team crushed it over the weekend there at Touchdown Atlantic. These people are working round the clock to put on these types of events. So I think they did a very great job out there. All the Haligonians, are they called? Were I believe so. Very, yes. oh, yeah, I think that's what it is. Were very c- courteous to us, I would say, out there. And one quote that stuck out to me from Andy Ambrosi was talking about that last kilometer that the league needs to cross over. If I'm reading into that again, I think that's him sort of saying to us, like, you know, we're positive about this too. There's still some things to cross off and go over, but that this expansion talk could actually be real. And if the league, as you mentioned, Hodge, is talking about taking this event, a neutral site game elsewhere in the country, that perhaps that also bodes well for the potential of an expansion franchise coming to Halifax. So at the end of it all, there's a lot of positivity. You can definitely see how a team would thrive in that market and how interested owners would want to have a CFL team out there because you'd be the only pro sports game in town. And in the summer, it is absolutely beautiful out there. And Haji, it wasn't even that hot on Saturday. There was a lot of cloud cover. You were okay. I think people would get through it. And honestly, I think at least for the first few years, if a franchise actually was able to be set up and got running out there, you'd have a lot of Canadians from across our great country going out there to support their CFL teams and also to check it out because it gives a good reason for CFL fans to go see the East Coast. That's how essentially you and I got there. I've only been out there one other time before the last two years to cover a game at Acadia University. So thank goodness for Canadian football taking me out there and discovering the beauty of the East Coast. Okay, that's a lie, though. That It was it was feeling like 40 degrees at kickoff. And then at halftime, <laughs> halftime, the wind picked up and the clouds came in. The first half, I baked like a like a chicken breast. It was <laughs> like a lobster. It was tough. Like, like a lobster. Yeah, that'd be a better comparison. Though I think most people boil lobsters instead of bake them. But I, I, I take your point. I take your point. One thing I will say about the event, and this might sound self-serving, but first of all, check out our exclusive interview with Randy Ambrosi that we did on YouTube. We did right off of it, but you can watch the, the, the video in full on our YouTube page. Was that Three Down Nation was the only independent uh, publication covering this event. Uh, most of the availabilities, there was Rob Vanstone from the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and there was one reporter from the Canadian press and then you and myself. So we made up essentially half the media contingent on the ground in Halifax. And it is unfortunate that travel has become very limited for a lot of publications, but I was very proud that we were able to represent ourselves so effectively and answer, or pardon me, ask a lot of the questions that needed to be answered by the league and by the two respective teams before and after the game not only about expansion, but also just about what's going on with those teams. We know that publications across the country wrote off those quotes from questions that we asked, and we're cool with that because we do the same thing in reverse. But I was proud to have been there and do the reporting on the ground that not only benefited our publication, but readers from other publications as well. Yeah, it was a fun week. Before we move on, Hodge, Shout out to all the Argos fans who are representing out there because (laughs) 
I think going into the week, dude, honestly, we both thought that it would be a pro Rough Riders crowd and it would probably feel like a home game for Saskatchewan. But that was not the case. And the one night, what was it? Friday night at Dirty Nelly's in downtown Halifax. That bar was packed with Argos fans. Pinball Clemens was there. You know, there was other people from the Argos organization that were in there like the Argos fans represented. So whenever there's people out here taking pot shots about how small the Argos fan base is, I think they've seen a modest uptick and those people are out there representing. So shout out to the double blue fans. Well, we also did speak to some Argos folks who indicated that had this game been played at BMO field, they felt like they could have had over 20,000 people in the seats for the first time in a long time. Now, obviously that's speculation on their part. And the Argos don't get to play at home for a while. But that is one thing that I do think is hurting Toronto's attendance a little bit, which is when the CFL essentially buys one of Toronto's home games and puts it out east, as they did last year as well. It does hurt the momentum at BMO a little bit, because surely there are some people in Toronto who haven't been to an Argos game in a bit who would go, hey, they're 6-0 and for the first time in 80-plus years. I want to go to a game. And it's like, oh, well, the next game is in like four weeks from now, because the schedule is so weird. I I don't think having inconsistency there is good, but all the more reason dunk to have 10 teams and a more consistent schedule. Edmonton has named Jarius Jackson, their new offensive coordinator, promoting him from his previous role as the team's quarterbacks coach and passing game coordinator. Steven McAdoo will remain on the staff and as, as an advisor dealing primarily with the defensive side of the football. Will this change help the Elks turn around their season or is it too little too late? It's too late, man. The Elks are not making the playoffs. I think it's easy to say that the Elks of 2023 RIP are dead. But I do <laughs> think it can put some energy into this offense. And dare I say that they actually give Trey Ford some burn on offense. And that could create some excitement for the fans. But this is really the only move that the Elks could make unless they were going to make wholesale changes. And we know that they can't do that because of the football operations cap limiting that. So I like this opportunity for Jarius Jackson. He's a former CFL quarterback. He clearly knows CFL offenses well. And I'm very interested to see how he does calling the plays. But I'm most interested to see whether or not he starts Trey Ford because that's the dude that I believe the Elks need to get some answers from in terms of can he be the long-term answer? Because at this point, I don't care if he's making over $400,000 this year. Taylor Cornelius has not shown any signs of life. He's more like a wet, limp noodle out there, (laughs) sucking energy away from that team. So put him at third string. Like, don't even let that guy talk anymore because he has not led this team to anything worth noting except for an 0-14 home record throughout this 0-21 streak. So find out what you got in Trey Ford. If you want to play Jared Daggy and you really like him, that's fine. But Ford, to me... Take off the Canadian label. If this guy was an American with his type of athleticism, people would be drooling all over him to give him a shot. So let's see what he can do, even though it's not the greatest circumstance for him to be playing a lot with the Elks. I do think that your assessment is correct. I don't think that this is a significant enough of a change. And I will say and and Jerry Matajong wrote a really good piece about this. He also wrote a racial slur in his article, which I thought was unfortunate. But he wrote a good article taking down the coach's cap or the operations cap that does hamper these franchises. And yes, we are in agreement that the coaching slash operations cap is something that needs to go away. That being said, I do want to touch on our last topic, which is expansion. The primary reason the operations cap was put in place Yes, was to keep salaries from ballooning, but a big part of that is helping the league to expand by saying to prospective owners, hey, this is the salary cap of what you can pay players, and this is the operations cap for what you can pay coaches, personnel, people, videographers, etc. And those two assured costs are helping allure people and prospective owners to the CFL. So There is a reason that it's in place. I think the solution to the problem is pretty simple. If you can't scrap the cap altogether because of what it provides expansion, you can simply just say once someone's fired, they no longer apply against the salary cap, essentially turning it the same way as you do with players on the salary cap. If you sign a guy to a two-year deal and you cut him after the first year, you don't owe him anything in the second year. Now, 
coaches, personnel guys, et cetera, would be paid the money for the second year of that deal. But it doesn't have to apply against the cap. You can just have, say, this is what you have to spend on operations every year. And if you fire somebody, that money no longer counts. That seems like a perfectly reasonable way to not hamper teams from year to year, but also they still do have a form of punishment, obviously paying out millions of dollars of salary to inf- to fired employees who you shouldn't hired in the first place is a pretty reasonable deterrent to making bad hires, which unfortunately is exactly what the Edmonton Elks did. Now, I will say this, something that I thought was very interesting. TSN reported that Stephen McAdoo, along with a number of assistant coaches in Edmonton, are under contract through 2024 which I thought was very interesting because it was previously reported. We talked a little bit about this previously on the show, Dunk, that Chris Jones was not under a four-year contract. He was under a series of one-year contracts spanning four seasons. In other words, from 2022 through 2025. If you were going to, and by the way, Victor Quee, the team's president and CEO, has since denied this saying it's a traditional four-year deal. I have sources who say the four-year deal has a buyout that would save Edmonton some money. But yes, it's essentially a four-year deal. If you sign Chris Jones to a series of one-year deals, which was not just reported by this publication, but by other publications as well, why on earth would you give all of his assistants three-year contracts? That makes literally no sense. So my suspicion, this is not fact. I'm not reporting this as fact. My suspicion, because this is the only thing that makes sense, is Chris Jones' staff got extensions last off season through 2024 that were not announced. And yes, the Elks are, you know, decrying the operations cap. Chris Jones took a shot at the operations cap in his media availability, but by the same token, this is 100% the Edmonton Elks making their bed and then having to sleep in it. They did not have to give three year, contracts to their assistants, which again, I don't think were three-year contracts. I think there were two-year contracts with a one-year extension added this past off season so that they weren't going into contract years. And that is a consequence that the team frankly should have to deal with after the horrible decisions that they have repeatedly made. They are not 0-8 by mistake. They have not lost 21 consecutive home games by mistake. This team is awful. And frankly, I was disappointed at some of the lack of accountability when it came to Chris Jones. Like I tweeted the other day, I watched the availability on on YouTube and he said, quote, special teams wise, I feel like we're playing pretty strong. Close quote. Well, Mr. Jones, your team is ninth in field goal percentage, ninth in net punting, ninth in kickoff average, eighth in special teams penalties, seventh in opponent punt return average and sixth in punt return average. This is not this is not accountability. This is, this is, it's a farce. Like, yes, he's acknowledged that the offense wasn't good enough, but anybody with basic knowledge of football could have told you from almost any Elks game this year that the offense was not good enough. The offense is not the full extent of Edmonton's problems. Yes, they're, they've, they've already announced they're moving on from Taylor Cornelius. He's going to be the short yardage guy. But the wound, the scar in Edmonton is a lot deeper than just Stephen McAdoo. And as much as I do think it's worth criticizing the operations cap, that is just one small piece of why this team sucks. And most of that reason is their own damn fault. And that, for the sake of Edmonton Elks fans, is really too bad because it is so sad seeing that franchise down this low, given the poor leadership it's had over the last number of seasons. Honestly, Chris Jones should probably be thanking the football operations cap for the situation because it means that he's in, could be, I should say, entrenched there. And based on, I'll call this informed speculation, as you mentioned, with Jones and his contract, he was signed to a series of one-year deals before Victor Kui came on board there. So based on people that I've talked to, their suspicion and I think that's a good word to use right now until we ask Victor Kui about this, is that Kui made that contract guaranteed through 2025. And yes, there is the possibility of that buyout. But I don't know why Chris Jones would be complaining about the football operations cap other than he was used to having like 20 or 30 guys underneath him scouting and coaching with him (laughs) in Saskatchewan. That's probably the reason this football operations cap was put in place. But 
it's keeping him employed. Although if his contract is guaranteed, that wouldn't necessarily matter in terms of him getting paid. I think that this seems to be a mistake made by Kui and whoever else decided to guarantee Jones through 2025, because you look at last season and yes, there were some signs that maybe this football team could get better, but let's look at the decision to sign Taylor Cornelius to a multi-year contract extension with guaranteed money in the final year of that contract. That was a terrible decision at the time. And it's even worse now. Like there were not people around the league who would have been clamoring to sign Taylor Cornelius to a deal worth over $400,000 in essentially hard money. So that decision in and of itself has been a major factor in this team being winless and also this winless streak at home. So I totally agree with you, Hodge. The Elks, everyone involved there, except for Trey Ford and maybe some other players who have been some bright lights, need to look at themselves in the mirror and understand the decisions they have made have put this franchise in a place where fans of the green and gold for a long time are putting brown paper bags on their head and coming out to the games. Like, it is awful. And there are people around the league who have said to me for a number of months now that the team that they were most worried about was the Edmonton Elks. And those people have been proven to be correct so far through 2023. And to be honest, through the entire 2023, because the Elks season is over. So the Elks made decisions to put themselves in this mess. They can't be out here complaining about rules that I don't even think would help them get out of it without, as you said, Hodge, taking ownership over the decisions that were made. And it's funny how quickly... Chris Jones has changed his tune about Taylor Cornelius. He was saying that they were going to stick with this guy. Now, all of a sudden, he's relegated to third string because they're 0-8 and, and on a bye week. Like, this is why you have to have people who are unbiased decoding what people say and talking to people behind the scenes to get what is the real situation that's going on. Well, and let's also – like, th- does Chris Jones think that we don't remember – things that happened over a month ago because in week four, they started Jarrett Deggy. Like Taylor Cornelius was objectively terrible. The first two games of the year, they got shut out week two in BC. He challenged, he gave Cornelius a vote of confidence the next week. And Edmonton put up a season high 31 points against Toronto. But late in that game, Jones pulled Cornelius for Deggy and then started Deggy the next week. Deggy only put up seven points against Ottawa and Cornelius has since made four starts. We were talking about this earlier with the Halifax conversation, pretending that ideas are new and fresh when, in fact, they're just (laughs) retreads of old ideas that were previously unsuccessful. This already falls into that category. You already went to Jared Deggie once, and it didn't work. And now you're saying, oh, well, just hold on here. We've got this exciting brand new idea. We're going to a guy named Jared Deggie or maybe Trey Ford. It's unclear at this point who will start if Edmonton is smart, which so far this year they've not been the proper thing to do is use both of them, which is really something that they should have been doing since week one. If you insist on starting Taylor Cornelius, at least have a Trey Ford package where he can come in and use his incredible speed for at least five to 10 snaps per game and take advantage of that. I wrote that when the Bombers hosted the Elks not too long ago, The Bombers have really struggled against mobile quarterbacks at times this year. Why not have Trey Ford run around like a maniac, 3-4 plays? He's literally the fastest quarterback in the CFL, running a true 4-4, and they've not used him. It is a mess at Edmonton. It is unfortunate. Yes, the operations cap deserves some of the blame, but I think you're bang on dunk. A lot of this falls at the feet of the team's leadership itself. And it is something that has led to the end of their season. I don't think that there's any hope for Edmonton over the next 10 games. And before we move on, one quick shout out to the fans who have paper bags on their heads. And the reason I say that is this. If you're a fan of this team, you would have every right to sit at home and not spend another dime going to the games or engaging with this team. And if you are a fan who's going to the game with a bag on your head, You're still putting money into the team's pocket. You're still being there. You're still supporting the team with purchasing food, purchasing beverages, buying gear, even if it's a team-issued paper bag. Maybe they should start selling those. That would help the bottom line right now. (laughs) And at least you're still engaging 
with the team. You haven't given up as long as you're showing up. So kudos to those fans. And hopefully one day soon, that team will not be so bad that you feel the need to put a paper bag on your head. I'll provide a little bit of balance here because I do have a lot of respect for Victor Kui. As do I. As do personal I. Personal friends that speak very highly of him. He obviously knows what he's doing in the sports media realm with what he did in the one championship, I believe it was called, in Asia, built a billion dollar entity. I know he doesn't like that being mentioned, but I think it should be mentioned here because he's done some great things digitally for the Edmonton Elks. And on the business side, they've had a bunch of awesome ideas that if there were just some wins could be capitalized on, but the football decision-making has not been great. So I think Kui is a smart hire and the Elks are lucky to have him as the president. They just need to get the football operations side right. And I think that as Kui learns more about the ins and outs of the CFL, that he'll be able to do that in the future. Hodge, you got one question for you. What do you think is more possible? The Toronto Argonauts going undefeated or the Edmonton Elks going winless in 2023? Certainly the Elks going winless. And I say that because it's impossible to go 18-0 in the CFL. I don't think it's actually something that is possible. The Argos, I see as a 15-win team this season. Edmonton, I don't think it's possible to go 0-18, but that was a co- topic of conversation that was had in Halifax, especially after that Saturday night embarrassment, 27 nothing to the BC Lions, was, is this the worst CFL team in the last 20 years? 2003, the Hamilton Tiger Cats went 1-17. That, I think, is a possibility for the Edmonton Elks this season, 1-17. And, and you mentioned it, if we want to provide some balance, I think the Edmonton Elks have the best digital team in the CFL. Their TikTok account, their YouTube page is all incredible. They do some amazing content. It would just be nice if they had a better team to showcase because right now that digital team is wasted on a miserable, miserable performing club. Bo Levi Mitchell suffered a fractured leg on the second last play of Hamilton's 16 to 12 win over the Ottawa Red Blacks in week eight. The injury occurred when Mitchell ran a QB sneak from the Ticats two yard line as they attempted to run out the clock late in the game. What does this setback mean for Mitchell and the Tabbies? Well, first of all, it needs to be said that this was one of the dumbest play calls I've ever seen. This was a late game situation. The Ticats could have simply knelt out the clock. They didn't. They decided to run short yardage, which has led to fumbles in the past and a four-point game on their own two-yard line. If you are going to run short yardage, at least put in your short yardage quarterback. Taylor or Kai Loxley had previously run short yardage in that game, and yet they've got 33-year-old Bo Levi Mitchell out there. I don't understand that. Bo Levi Mitchell has never really been a short yardage quarterback. It is a freak injury. It is something that, you know, you can't necessarily predict what happened, but it is something that has absolutely marred this next little run here for the Ticats. Now, it should be said, Taylor Powell has arguably been better than Bo Levi Mitchell this season. Bo Levi Mitchell threw five picks in that game. His touchdown to interception ratio this season is three to nine, which is truly abysmal. There's no way around that in this day and age. A one-to-one touchdown interception ratio is not considered good, much less one-to-three. That's insane. Typically, Bo Levi Mitchell, that number's reversed. Three touchdowns for every pick. This year, it's backwards. So on the football field, I will say, maybe this team is fine with Taylor Powell, given the way that Bo Levi Mitchell has played. He did make some great throws in that game, slinging it into some tight windows, but for every one that he slung into a tight window, he slung another one into the open arms of a red blacks defender. So you got to criticize the play call. And and at the same time, again, I I am curious though, to see what Taylor Powell does with this next opportunity. Matthew Schultz is not coming back anytime soon from his injury. Boldy by Mitchell had surgery. One would think he's going to be out at least six weeks. So this is Taylor Powell's team for the foreseeable future. And I'm I'm excited to watch him play. You know, I, I don't think he was as dynamic as Dustin Crum has been as a rookie quarterback, but he certainly didn't look bad in his lone start of the year. The, the, the Ticats did lose that game, but they're also playing the Argos, who have been killing everybody. So I'm curious to see what Taylor Powell does with this next little run. Yeah, it's just another unfortunate injury, I think, for Bo Levi Mitchell that he's suffered now sort of back-to-back-to-back 
seasons here. Like 2019 was the shoulder. 2021, he played on a broken leg. 2022, we know he was largely healthy, but 2023, now he breaks his leg and he's had his issue earlier in the season with what I believe to be a torn groin. And, you know, in this situation, I think there was some reporting around this that this wasn't necessarily the play call that it was supposed to be, but Levi Mitchell just kneeling out the clock very quickly. Like, literally, you should just take the snap unless you need to tick some seconds off the clock. But you can even tell the defense and the referees what you're doing, that you're not going to run anywhere. Let those seconds tick down unless you get some pushback from the defense and put your knee down on the ground. So I don't think Mitchell put himself in the best position there for this injury to occur, but it's something that is just so fluky. So, you know, I don't like people out here saying in hindsight, well, you should have Kyle Oxley in the ball game because usually when a team is kneeling out the clock or when it's a late game situation like this, you have your number one guy in there because he's the guy that got you to this win. Now, I don't think Bolivar Mitchell led them to the win because he had five picks, and I think Ottawa should have won the game. Dustin Crum needs to be better in terms of actually looking down the field to pass. Too many times when we were watching this game together in Halifax with a bar filled with Argos fans, (laughs) Dustin Crum was, I believe, looking downfield and then trying to find a lane to run. He wasn't actually looking to pass. That is my speculation based on watching the TV angle of this game. And I think this was one the Red Blacks are going to be, you know, upset about that they didn't win the game because they got five picks on defense. So I think the Red Blacks right now are the second best team pretty clearly in the East Division. Montreal, I think, will challenge them for that and could legitimately do that. And the Ticat season is going to go as Powell goes if they can keep a quarterback healthy. Like, think of this. They've had Bolivar Mitchell out and back in. Matthew Schiltz out. And then now he's out for a while. And Powell took some shots there when he was playing for them too. So I agree with Hodge. Powell is an intriguing prospect. I think he's shown the most out of any quarterback who's put on the black and gold so far this season. With all due respect to Bolivar Mitchell and the two MOPs and two great cups that he's won in his career. It just seems like these injuries are piling up. And he doesn't have the same zip on the ball as he does, or sorry, used to anymore you talk to people around the league and they'll say that and there's balls that are fluttering over receivers that are going into defensive back hand defensive backs hands and I'll say it again I respect the heck out of Bolivar Mitchell he's been great for this league he is one of the rare stars that this league has been able to develop that if Bolivar Mitchell says or does something usually people pay attention I think he's a guy that should have marketing campaigns with companies across this country but that's a discussion for another day. So I hope Bull Levi Mitchell heals and can come back and prove some of the haters wrong right now, but it just doesn't look like he has it. So the Ticats are going to have to roll with Powell, who does have some traits that make you think he could be, and I stress could be, a QB1 of the future. Yeah, it's a bad turn for the Ticats in what was supposed to be a potential Grey Cup, you know, home appearance That seems like a long shot right now. Toronto's obviously the number one team in the division. My number two team by a pretty considerable margin right now is the Montreal Alouettes. Cody Fajardo's doing just enough. William uh, Stanback got going a little bit. And defensively, Noel Thorpe's defense is playing fast and physical as always. And specials, they're good. Joseph Zima's a very underrated punter. Chandler Worthy has made some big plays. To me, the Ticats are in a dogfight for number three right now against another very banged-up Red Blacks team. Though... Ottawa has gotten a bunch of guys back, even though they got Shaq Evans back, Jovan Santos Knox back last week, and they just took Braylon Addison off the six-game injury list. Addison could, if he's able to re-find his form from 2019, could provide Dustin Crum one more reason to be looking downfield, that's for sure. Craig Dickinson said the Riders are sticking with Mason Fine as their starter after he, quote, did enough, close quote, against the Argos in touchdown Atlantic. Fine has thrown for 580 yards, zero touchdowns, and four picks in two starts this year, albeit against the league's two best defenses in BC and Toronto. Is Dickinson making the right decision? I believe he is, and a lot of people are going to laugh at that, but I think if you give Fine a little bit more time, then you get a real idea of what he could potentially do. Don't get me wrong. Jake Dolagallo looked really good at against the Argonauts, albeit at the end of the game. And that's why I think you need to stick with fine a little bit because if Jamal Morrow doesn't fumble on the goal line, perhaps this 
game looks a little bit different. And Hodge, you and I both said this. The first throw from Mason Fine in that touchdown Atlantic game was an intermediate completion. He stepped into it, drove the ball down the field, and looked really good. And I thought, okay, here we go. That's a great confidence builder. But after that, it was – you know, almost a bunch of nothing for Mason Fine. And I am okay with the Riders giving him one more start, but to see the way that Jake Dolagala threw the football and, you know, based on talking to one of our colleagues in the media, Jamie Nye of CGME, he's at practice every day and has watched Dolagala up close. So this guy has a live arm and it seemed to just have a different energy around the huddle when he came into the game there. Again, it was at the end of a game, which was a blowout. So the Argonauts are not going to be playing full go. And you could argue that it's some off coverage that he's working against, but still threw a great corner ball to Sean Bain Jr. for a touchdown and just had some energy around that offense for really the first time in that game. So I'm all right with them starting Mason Fine again, as long as if he struggles, Jake Dolagala is the next guy up. I was surprised interviewing the uh, interviewing Mason Fine, the new franchise quarterback of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, at least out of uh, since since Trevor Harris was out. How small he is! Like he looks not very big on the field, but I'm six two. He's listed at five eleven. I don't think he's an inch above five nine. He is a petite guy. He's he's built. He's thick. But he is he is a step down in height, even from a guy like Jeremiah Masoli, who's kind of the prototype for a stocky CFL quarterback. Um, I I liked some of what I saw from Mason Fine. I certainly saw improvement from the previous week when I thought he really struggled against the BC Lions, checking it down for three quarters and then throwing the two kind of back breaking fourth quarter picks. I thought that he did a better job of fitting the ball into windows down the field, going through his reads. I thought he held the ball a little bit longer, which is what Craig Dickinson said he wanted to see from Mason Fine. I did think it was interesting that he left the game late and then afterwards told us that he wasn't hurt and could have played, especially because two nights previous, Craig Dickinson had told me that Mason Fine would have a long leash and not a short leash and was the guy. Mason Fine is our quarterback because Trevor Harris is not coming back anytime soon. That was what Craig Dickinson said. I'm paraphrasing. You can read the quotes in the article I wrote off of it. But to me, it's a lot easier to stick with Mason Fine for now and go to Jake Dolagala later rather than going with Jake Dolagala now and potentially asking Mason Fine to come back into the lineup if Jake Dolagala either struggles or gets hurt. I think this is the proper decision. And I do think that the matchups are something that we should be talking about. The BC Lions defense is almost historically good. This team is averaging 13 points allowed per game. They are not just number one in net yards allowed. They are number one by a margin of over 60 yards. They have been so stingy this year. Unbelievable. They made Zach Kolaris look terrible in week three. If Zach Kolaris can't make plays against this defense, I don't expect Mason Fine to go out there and make plays against this defense. So I'm curious to see how he does against Ottawa this week. Ottawa's defense has been very respectable so far this season, but it's certainly not on the level, at least right now, of what we've seen in BC and Toronto. So I think giving him the chance to start at home, giving him the chance to start against a defense that is not as strong, I think is good. If he struggles again, I think that is when you pull the pin and go to Jake Dolagala. I will say Jake Dolagala is in the CFL for a reason. When you talk to people who are in and around practice, they'll tell you that he lacks consistency. He has extremely high highs and then extremely low lows. We saw an extremely high high in the game late in Halifax, but that was a very small sample size. So I think we need to see more of Mason fine, but I don't think that leash, this is my speculation. I don't think that leash is super long anymore. I think if he goes out there and struggles this week against Ottawa, we're going to see Jake Dolagawa again. That's my speculation. That Ottawa defense ain't no joke now. Lorenzo Malden out here saying, put some respect on my name and my unit's okay. name. And you didn't even mention this dude. Justin Howell is going to be back for the Red Black. So This is true. I don't think that that is an easy opponent to go against in this professional football. So all these guys get paid. But it is worth noting that Fine has played the top to far and away best defenses in the CFL to start this little stretch of him as QB1. But at some point, you got to show some signs of improvement. I don't care who you're going against because every week it's not going to be easy. And I was going to say, 
even if you're going against the Edmonton Elks because they've played some decent football on defense, they just let the other offenses have the ball so much. I will say quickly before we go on, Ottawa's defense is fifth in points allowed and sixth in net yards allowed. So it's a solid group, no disrespect, but it's it's not BC or Toronto who are right up there at the top. Toronto's allowed more yardage, but I think that's just because they've led so much. Teams are throwing the ball against them like crazy. So Toronto and, and BC, to me, the two best defenses. Ottawa's decent, but it is a step down. No disrespect, Lorenzo Malden, if you're listening. <laughs> The Winnipeg Blue Bombers are five and a half point favorites at home against the BC Lions on Thursday night. The two teams met in week three with the Leos dominating on route to a 30 to six victory, though Vernon Adams Jr. remains out of the starting lineup due to a knee injury with Dane Evans set to get the nod for BC. Who you got? I've got the Bombers to win, but I've got the Lions to cover in this one. This is as close to a must win as a five and two football team could possibly have in the summertime. Winnipeg lost the first matchup between these two teams this season. If they lose this one, they've lost the season series. And they're also four points back of the BC lines. That likely means given the schedules, BC has got a soft schedule the rest of the way this season that Winnipeg would not host the West final for a third straight year. I think they're going to get it done. Dane Evans, I think, looked solid last week, but he was doing it against Edmonton so far this year. Everybody's looked good against Edmonton. I think the Bombers step up and get it done on home turf. The Lions are also traveling. They're coming off a short week. That is a disadvantage. And they're also without Josh Banks, who I think is the most, if not the most, certainly one of the most underrated players in the CFL at defensive tackle. So I like the Lions to cover, but I think the Bombers are going to close it out. But by uh, let's give it a Sergio Castillo field goal. There are multiple reasons here to like the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. First and foremost, Dane Evans is not a mobile quarterback in Hodge. You've talked about this, and I think it's a smart point. Winnipeg has struggled against guys that can move the football with their feet and create off schedule plays with their arm down the field by using their legs to get free. So that is reason number one. Dane Evans has seen his action against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders who haven't been great on defense and the Edmonton Elks who, you know, are towards the bottom of the CFL on D and also the fact that the blue bombers are coming off a bye and they know how big this game is and time and time again, throughout this fantastic run that the blue bombers have had since winning the Grey cup in 2019, this team rises to the occasion. So I'm actually going to take the bombers to cover that obviously means that I think that they win, but I think they want to respond in a major way here to what happened all the way back in week three when I believe some of the quotes, Hodge, even that you had, Winnipeg saying that they felt embarrassed by that game. So I think they want to write a lot of what they felt were wrongs in that week. I'll take a motivated Winnipeg team, especially Zach Kolaris. You've alluded to it. Didn't look great against the BC Lions in week three. I think he's going to be highly motivated. And oh, by the way, the Bombers have their best playmaker in the lineup on the field. Talking about going for 2,000 yards after he's already <laughs> missed a handful of games in Kenny Lawler. So I will take the Bombers to cover the spread. The Calgary Stampeders are eight-point underdogs on Friday night when they host the Toronto Argonauts at Big Man Stadium. The Stamps are coming off back-to-back -back losses against East Division opponents and are 0-3 at home to start the year. Can the Stamps cover or even potentially win against the undefeated Argos? Whew, man, it is an ideal spot. And really, in a bunch of other scenarios here, I would be taking the Stampeders as major home dogs. But this Toronto Argonauts team is so laser-focused on what they're doing. They don't turn the football over. They take it away at the best rate in the CFL right now. And I just don't trust Jake Mayer to even be able to keep it close, to be quite honest. He couldn't get a win on the road in Montreal that, in my opinion, was a must-win situation for Calgary. I still think there's a way that they can get into the playoffs because the Rough Riders aren't that good at quarterback in their own right right now with Mason Fine and Joe, Jake Dolagala, excuse me. But I'll take Swag Kelly, A.J. Ouellette, Tavares Daniels, Sean Oakman, Flo Ormalade, 
Jordan Williams, Royce Mechie, all these guys to put it on the stamps in Calgary. I'm going to take the Argos to win. I think they absolutely go to 7-0. and but I am taking the Stampeders to cover in this one. And maybe I'm just thinking back to last year when the Stampeders embarrassed Toronto at McMahon Stadium. I think that game was 29-2, to two, which happened also shockingly late in the year. Like the Argos <laughs> won the Grey Cup six, seven weeks later after getting their butts absolutely whipped in Cowtown. But I am going to take the Stamps to cover here. The Stampeders are 2-5. and five. They've got a murderer's row coming up. They've got Toronto, I believe it's twice, Winnipeg once, and BC once before Labor Day. Now, I'm going to go out on a wild limb here and suggest that the Stampeders are going to beat the Edmonton Elks on Labor Day. I know, shocking, bold <laughs> prediction. But up until that point, they need to get a couple of wins here. Yes, the Riders are struggling at third place, but I think the Calgary realizes that they need to make some hay even with the tough going for the next month, they can't just rely on that back-to-back -back with Edmonton to pick up some W's and pick up some momentum. So I think they're going to keep it close. The coaching staffs in Toronto and Calgary are almost one and the same with how many people have been in both places. You know, Ryan Dinwiddie, guys like Corey Mays, guys like Pete Costanza, so many, not just coaches, players as well in Toronto were in Calgary. These teams know each other very well. They know each other's schemes very well. I think that helps keep it close, even if the Argos keep rolling in the win column. The Hamilton Tiger Cats are two and a half point home underdogs to the Montreal Alouettes on Saturday in a battle of two teams currently tied for second place in the East Division. Bill Levi Mitchell will not play for the Tiger Cats, giving Taylor Powell a chance to make his second career start. Can the Tiger Cats get it done at the donut box? There's a possibility, but I don't think so. I like the Alouettes in this ball game, especially if Cody Fajardo is going to continue to protect the football and they can run the rock with William Stanbeck because I like the way the defense looked with Sean Lemon over there. I think he brought a new energy that we're getting after the quarterback better in week eight against Jake Mayer. And I think Noel Thorpe's unit has been playing very fast and physical this season. Chandler Worthy is as dangerous as anybody in the return game right now in the CFL, maybe outside of Javon Leak in Toronto. But I really like what Montreal has going on here. I think they're a little bit under the radar, and I just don't feel the vibe with the Ticats right now. So give me Montreal the cover on the road. I am taking the Alouettes as well here. This is only two and a half points you got to eat. I would be happy to take this up to four, maybe even five points. Noel Thorpe's defense I think will make life very difficult for the rookie quarterback. I 100% agree with what you said, Dunk. I think Sean Lemon has breathed some new life, some new energy into this Alouette's defense. By the way, Almondo Sewell and Sean Lemon were college teammates at Akron, and they've both been in the CFL for over a decade. I believe this marks the first time they've ever been teammates in the regular season which is wild to think that they played in college for, I think it's four full years as part of a, apparently a stacked Zips defensive line. And now they're doing it over 10 years later in the Belle Provence. I love that. Yes, the Alouettes just had a three-game losing streak. Guess who they lost to? Winnipeg, BC, and Toronto. Teams that everybody has lost to so far this season. I like them to win this game. Cody Fajardo has not been flashy, but he does not have to be flashy. He just has to be consistent enough. He almost wasn't consistent enough. My goodness, he missed that late deep shot to KO Julian Grant this past week. That was a heartbreaker just because, man, that would have been such a nice play. But I am taking the Alouettes here. I think they are the better team right now. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders are short, short home underdogs at home against the Ottawa Red Blacks on Sunday night in a game that opened as a pick -em. The Red Blacks are coming off a tight loss to the Ticats, while Saskatchewan got splashed by the Argonauts and touched down Atlantic. Can the Riders get their first win with Mason Fine as their QB1? I'm taking the Riders here, Dunk. I am. I think Mason Fine has taken some steps. Do I expect him to be the second coming of Ron Lancaster? No. But I do <laughs> think that he has done enough. I think that Ottawa's defense, as much as they've done a good job rallying to the football, Again, it's not as tough as the two defenses that Mason Fine has seen so far this season. Defensively, I think Saskatchewan is going to do a great job of keeping Dustin Crum in the pocket and making life difficult for him. You mentioned it. He is not, at the current rate of the hits that he's taking, going to be able to finish out 
this season. He's got to play smarter. And if he in a very tough environment at Mosaic Stadium is pushing the ball downfield, that could be a great opportunity for Jason Shiver's unit to get some picks and force some takeaways. So I am taking the Riders to win and cover a very short spread at home. That's what could be a great equalizer here is the noise at Mosaic Stadium that I don't think Dustin Crum has experienced yet in the CFL. It's usually one of the louder buildings. I don't think it's the loudest these days because that designation goes to IG Field. But I'm taking the Ottawa Red Blacks. I like the reinforcements that they're getting back at the lineup. And if Dustin Crum can, for the majority of the game at least, deliver the football in rhythm and on time and not just be looking for lanes to run on design passing plays. And I think the Red Blacks can be dangerous. I thought they should have beat the Tiger Cats a week ago. If they would have won that game, getting those five picks, I think this line could be definitely different because people would be feeling different about Ottawa. So I think there's actually some value there. And the Red Blacks know that they got to win games here to keep pace in, dare I say, a tight East division, especially if they want to have a shot at a home game. I know we're not at Labor Day yet, but the Red Blacks need a bounce back game here, and so does Dustin Crum, so I'll take Ottawa. Something that's starting to get a little bit of buzz on social media is the possibility of an East crossover, something that's never happened, but right now it is close to happening. Obviously, the fourth-place team in the East would have to be better than the third-place team in the west right now that's not the case but the riders have the same number of points as the bottom three teams in the east division i almost wonder if that were to happen i don't think it's going to happen this year but the thought of it happening is wild considering how much stronger the west division has been in recent years it's time for hodges heritage moment on this day in 2013 the alouettes fired head coach dan hawkins The longtime NCAA head coach was tasked with replacing Mark Tressman, who had departed for the NFL the previous winter. Montreal got off to a two and three start under Hawkins with two of those losses coming against the powerhouse Calgary Stampeders. The firing made Hawkins time with the Alouettes, one of the shortest head coaching tenures in CFL history. Montreal finished the season eight and ten under GM Jim Pop, who took over the interim role, losing the East semifinal in overtime to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Dunk, what do you remember about Dan Hawkins? <laughs> it did not go as well as anybody thought in terms of him transitioning over from American football to CFL football. He seemed like a nice dude, but it was very quickly apparent that he was in way over his head trying to learn the CFL game and even try to coach it to all these guys that were on his roster. I don't really remember Dan Hawkins other than what I remember being a surprisingly full and moppy head of hair for someone who was an older gentleman (laughs) at the time. That being said, I do think that it's refreshing and someone poignant given the current state of the CFL with his operations cap that we can look fondly at a time when coaches could simply get fired for not being good coaches. That was that that, that's probably something that should still be a thing in the CFL but right now isn't necessarily a thing in the CFL. You can lose all your games and keep your job because of the the ramifications of replacing you, which is interesting. Three-minute drill. Here we go. Andrew Harris officially surpassed childhood hero Charles Roberts for fifth on the CFL's all-time rushing list at Touchdown Atlantic. Hodge, we saw it live. What does that say about Harris's career? Well, the thing that stuck out most to me was after the game, he talked about running into Charles Roberts at the Palomino nightclub in Winnipeg when he was 18. And I think that's the first time any person has publicly admitted that they were partying at the Palomino club. Everybody did it back in the day. Nobody copped to it. And folks in Winnipeg (laughs) will know exactly why. Ja'Gara Davis, the trade for him was voided after he failed his physical at the Stampeders, reportedly due to a meniscus injury. What does the future hold for the former all-star pass rusher? Uh, I don't think he's going to like it. I think his football career is near done, and there was a reason that the Tiger Cats wanted to trade him away. He had been a healthy scratch for performance-based reasons, and there was a major reason why the Tiger Cats were trying to get rid of him. So, it's an awkward situation where this player has to go back to this team that had just traded him away. And, you know, maybe they'll try to get him in the rotation there, but 
you're probably not going to be able to trade him to another team with this meniscus injury. So I think the end of his career is near if it's not already here. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers sold out the Banjo Bowl a full month early. What does that say about the fans in the peg? Well, it says that they're excited for what I think is the best rivalry game in the CFL. Obviously, this number is boosted a little bit by fans coming in from Ryderville, who we know travel well. But I can say from experience, I've been at every Banjo Bowl, and the Banjo Bowl the last two years have been more blue than ever before. I think locals are getting hyped for it. And, I mean, the Bombers led the league in attendance last year. Clearly, they're ultra excited for this game. Should be a good one. Calgary has officially placed James Vodders on the six-game injured list due to an arm injury. Will we see him again this season? I hope so, but there are some people out there in the Berta that are worried about Vodders potentially being out for the season, and that's a major blow because he was playing at a high level after being a big-time signing coming back from the NFL, going to Calgary. So I hope he can heal and get back on the field just because he's a special player. Hodge, you released your annual comprehensive list of Canadians and former CFL players in the NFL. Who is the guy you're most excited to watch down south? I think my answer is the same as everybody's answer. It's Nathan Rourke. I mean, there's 51 guys on the list. I'd encourage you to check it out if you haven't already. But there's no question here. It's Nathan Rourke and what he's doing with the Jacksonville Jaguars. You had an article on him yesterday, Dunk. The the, the coaching staff is excited to see what he can do at the controls. Presumably, he's going to play in the preseason. It's yet to be determined how much, but there's only three quarterbacks on the roster, and I can't see the Jaguars putting Trevor Lawrence, their prized star franchise quarterback, in harm's way very much for those games. So hopefully we get a chance to see Nathan Rourke in those games, and hopefully he balls out because fans in the NFL deserve to know how good of a player this guy is. The Edmonton Elks now officially hold the longest home losing streak in any North American professional sports league. Will they get their first home win in week 10 against Winnipeg after the bye? Hell no, there is no way, bro. This streak is going to go on for a while unless my dude Trey Ford puts a stop to it. (laughs) Come on. You think Trey Ford's going to beat Winnipeg? Not Winnipeg, but I'm saying down the road. Calgary St. Peter's linebacker Micah Awe was fined for high hits on quarterbacks in back-to-back weeks. Does that make him a dirty player, Hodge? I don't want to say he's a dirty player, but I also think that Micah Awe has a bit of a reputation. I think he's going to get more calls than some other players, so I think he needs to do a better job of keeping his nose clean and not give officials a reason to throw a flag. The Jacksonville Jaguars have, quote, high hopes, close quote, for Canadian QB Nathan Rourke leading their offense in the preseason. What do you expect to see from the 25-year-old in his first live CFL action? Well, Press Taylor, the offensive coordinator, was the one who delivered that quote. And he also said that Nathan Rourke, as well as all the other quarterbacks in camp there, Trevor Lawrence and C.J. Beathard, have been really accurate. So that's positive to hear that if Rourke, you know, hasn't felt any nerves in training camp so far yet and is putting the ball on the money. That, to me, gives confidence to the 25-year-old that he can go down there and ball in the preseason. Some people might say, ah, preseason is meaningless. But for Nathan Rourke, it this is. is going to be massive. It might be for a lot of people. But as we saw last year with Chris Trevler, that's how he that's made the true. roster with the New York Jets. And for Nathan Rourke's career, this game type, will be heavily evaluated by all the teams that checked him out in the offseason. He had 12 workouts and even all the other teams that are interested because they'll even tell you in the NFL, there's not necessarily enough quarterbacks to go around. And if Nathan Rourke plays well in the preseason, that will bode well for his future NFL opportunities. You you are right. They, the games do matter. I just think the narrative that coaches try to spin is that it's an open competition and jobs are truly up for grabs in the preseason when in fact preseason instead of mattering you know 70 percent they they matter about two percent so they do matter it's just not very much chris treveler just did an incredible job of capitalizing on his two percent last year that's why he's still with the new york jets i think it does matter for some of the back end roster guys but you're right with the draft capital and millions of dollars invested in these high round picks especially the first rounders that largely you have an idea unless There's a guy who is like an undrafted free agent or a late round pick that consistently performs in training camp. 
and in the preseason, then it's hard for coaches to turn a blind eye to that type of performance. In 1966, Saskatchewan Rough Riders Grey Cup ring is currently for sale online with an asking price of almost 70,000 Canadian dollars. Is that worth the money? You know what? It is a piece of history. It's not something that I'm going to be bidding on, but it is something that is unique given the fact that it was the only title that the Riders won during the first almost 80 years of their existence. And so, hey, to the right, very wealthy Saskatchewan Rough Riders fan, why not go out and buy a piece of history? You could certainly do a lot worse. It's a night, it's an old ring. It's not as glitzy and glamorous as a lot of the new ones, but it's a very sharp looking ring. And I can't imagine that there was never that many of them made. The, the rosters were so small back in the 60s. Coaching staffs were small, personnel staffs were small. There's, I don't know how many of these things are floating around, but my, I, I'd speculate to say there's like maybe as few as 65, whereas, you know, modern days, you've got hundreds of these things kicking around. So that's pretty cool. On that note, we thank you as always for listening to the Three Donation podcast. We'll see you next week for another episode.